Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final session of the first day of the 37th Annual Oregon Rural Health Conference and our first virtual conference. Uh, I want to welcome our guests, and uh, we have one more coming, but as uh, happens with some virtual conferences, uh, as we learn about them, we, we have a couple tweaks, so she'll be joining us here shortly. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Oregon Rural Health Policy, where we go from here. Uh, there's no uh, doubt in anybody's mind that 2020 has been kind of a crazy year, whether you're a provider, a policymaker, a patient, a community member, whatever it might be. Um, but this last year has had an impact on all of us. And so we want to spend the next um, hour having a chat about how we think that's going to change us in the coming years from several different perspectives. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. Uh, we have Representative uh, Andrea Salinas, who's representative from House District 38. We have Brian Beringer, who's the CEO of the Oregon Medical Association. And we have uh, Becky Haltberg from uh, President CEO of the Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And Becky will be joining us uh, here shortly. And so what I'd like to do is turn it over to <laughs> Representative Salinas to get us started. Thank you, Bob, and um, thank you to folks who are out there in the virtual world um, listening to this last panel. I know these things can take some you know, time to get used to. Um, I think your question is a good one about kind of what we expect to see in the coming year and years. I think COVID has really um, pulled the curtain back on some health disparities that currently exist that feel like they were exacerbated during the time of COVID. Um, and that I think we can be doing things differently. So, I mean, as everyone knows, um, you know, residents in rural counties really don't have access to healthcare the way um, some of us do in urban areas. And so those rural and frontier areas, I think are seeing things with COVID um, just exacerbated um, in terms of access. Um, it was enumerated in the 2020 Unmet Healthcare Needs Report that Oregon's rural and frontier areas are continuing to see provider shortages. And I'm sure that has not changed with COVID. 10 rural and frontier primary care service areas have zero primary care providers. And this doesn't stop with physical health. As we know, 21 rural and frontier service areas have zero mental health care providers. And these are the, some of the things, the services that we've been um, seeing a great deal of need for, even in our urban areas um, through COVID. Um, and then trying to figure out what the equity lens is on all of this as well. As we know, some of our populations, um, like the Latinx community, you know, where we represent about 13% of the state population, but we're seeing 38 to 40% of COVID cases. Um, how do we make sure that we start to close those gaps? And a lot of those folks are also in rural areas. So I think those are some of the questions that I and my colleagues, <clears throat> excuse me, have been asking ourselves and trying to figure out you know, how do we get the data? Again, going back to the things that we've known for a long time, we don't have data for some of these populations. We don't have, oh my goodness, my dog, have um, as good of data as uh, as we should um, to be able to make some public health decisions. So that's one thing I've been working on, how we make sure that our hospital and hospital systems and our providers um, have um, the COVID data that they need right now. So I've been working with, um, the um, Oregon Health Leadership Council and trying to make sure that even post COVID, we start to bridge some of these gaps in data um, and analysis. And then finally, I think the big thing that we're gonna see um, a real issue with and a real problem with is our, our revenue and our funding. Um, folks probably know that Measure 108 just recently passed and thank you to um, the hospital system and a good coalition of, um, of providers and um, unions and different folks who, who helped to get that passed. But even with that, and that's supposed to be a tobacco and vaping tax um, that will help close the gap for OHP. But even with that, we're still gonna see um, quite a gap um, somewhere close to about $400 million for the Oregon Health Plan. So we have to figure out how we're going to start um, closing that gap as well. And then for folks, um, following kind of what happened in the election. We also have measure 110 coming up, um, which, you know, for some folks, like I like the policy, I don't really like funding and trying to figure out a budget in ballot measures, but it reclassifies possession of small amounts of drugs as a civil violation, um, which again, I like the policy, but it uses um, the marijuana tax dollars 
to essentially reallocate and try to figure out how we actually um, provide some addiction treatment and harm reduction efforts with those marijuana dollars. So I think that will be another area where we're going to start needing to to shift funds around. Um, and then, you know, we haven't seen a huge increase on um, the Oregon health plan, which I think is surprising some folks, you know, I think some of it is um, that we have seen um, our our employer um, sponsored health plans continue to cover folks on the health um, on their insurance. Um, but I I'm expecting to see an increase. So, um, you know, trying to figure out how we fund all of this as we go into um, the 2021 session and beyond, I think are going to be some of our biggest challenges and clearly challenges in terms of access and care um, for our rural and frontier communities. Um, and then finally, <laughs> I don't know if I should mention this, but, you know, reimbursement rates, which is always a struggle and we're getting some pressure right now from the feds, I think, to re-examine um, some of our reimbursement rates. So, so nothing I said here felt good. <laughs> so I want, I want to give some areas of hope. We did have a couple, I think, of um, good work groups over the summer. The Governor's um, Behavioral Health Advisory Council, co-chaired by um, Senator Roblin and Senator Denise Bowles, I think gave some good insight into where we're falling short in terms of behavioral health. And now the, the Governor's Racial Justice Council is trying to figure out how we prioritize some of those um, policy priorities for um, behavioral and mental health. And then, you know, whether that gets put in the governor's recommended budget. Um, the um, House also, I asked for a, group, a work group on uh, universal access to primary care, knowing that this is a big issue area for our rural and uh, frontier folks as well. And this was co chaired by Representative Prusak and Representative Moore Green. To really figure out how across the state, but certainly in those areas that lack access, how we get them better access and whether it's through, you know, primary centered um, patient care homes or, you know, whether it's extending our, our community health worker access and really just trying to meet people where they are, including behavioral health, dental, vision, everything, realizing that, you know, we need to meet people where they are, when they come in, when they're ready um, for that service. So I will stop there because I know there are other panelists and um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Absolutely, thanks. And I'll turn it over to uh, Becky and Brian. Thanks, Bob. Um, and really appreciate the invitation to be on this panel today. Um, I'm gonna take a step back and and because I think any discussion of health policy right now, especially rural health policy really needs to be kind of be informed by the experience that we've had over the last eight months, which I think has been um, transformational and not necessarily in a good way. Um, and so let's, I wanna talk about how COVID-19 is impacting our thinking about healthcare policy and talk about a couple of the near term um, priorities and things that we're thinking about and then close out with just a, a little bit about what the good that we can take from this experience. So no, no news to any of you, COVID-19 has caused unprecedented disruption to our healthcare system, to our economy, and that disruption is really unknown right now. It is of uncertain intensity, uncertain duration, and uncertain, uncertain long-term effect. So this makes it really hard to plan, whether you're in healthcare or some other industry, yet we all know that we have to factor COVID-19 into our planning scenarios. So a month or two into the pandemic, I was really thinking about COVID-19 as a natural disaster. It would be it was an event it would be an event where we would respond, we'd recover, and we'd rebuild. But I think what we've learned is that COVID-19 is not just a normal natural disaster. Um, it's a pandemic that's unprecedented in our lifetimes. It's a disaster that is occurring everywhere all at once with waves of varying intensity and severity. And as much as we'd like a vaccine to quickly return us to a pre-COVID normal. The reality is that even with the vaccine, we're gonna be living with this disease for a very long time. So my thoughts about COVID-19 have shifted um, really from thinking about a post-COVID reality to thinking about how we manage COVID-19 in our systems, in our society, like we would manage a chronic disease. And that means we have to manage the virus and we have to advance our other priorities. So we have to begin to view healthcare through a pandemic lens. And you know, what does it mean to view healthcare through a pandemic lens? I mean, I think it means that we need to ask ourselves what new imperatives COVID-19 has created, and then look at how COVID-19 has impacted the priorities that we identified before the pandemic, which are still very real today, some of which um, Representative Salinas just mentioned. And I think the answer to these questions provides us with our new imperatives, which are the things that we have to do really well to survive and thrive in a COVID-19 world, 
and also to that will help us to continue to advance healthcare affordability, access and quality. And so I want to give you five of my new imperatives and your list may look a little bit different, um, but these are the things that are top of mind for me. The first is responding to the virus. We know we have to respond to the virus and manage it well in our communities in order to keep our health system, um, keep capacity in our health system to keep um, our population healthy um, and to keep our economy strong. Behavioral health, we had issues in our behavioral health system before the pandemic. This experience has put a spotlight on those issues. Now we need to look ahead, potentially in a time of declining resources. So we're gonna have to structure, look at structurally how we address the behavioral health system if we want to get different outcomes. Um, the third thing is accelerating the movement to value. The fee-for-service system failed us in the pandemic. When revenue disappeared from our healthcare system at the same time, we needed resources to respond to the pandemic. So this was important and we knew what the future was valued before, but the pandemic is going to cause us to accelerate the movement to value. The fourth is diversity and health equity, which Representative Salinas touched on. We knew we had inequities in our system pre-pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated those inequities, and now this is needs to become a burning platform for us. And the, the final one is breaking down the silos in the healthcare system. We can't afford to look at the healthcare system as an acute care system, a behavioral health system, and a post-acute system, and a community-based system. We have to look at it holistically because we find inefficiencies and, and worse outcomes when those systems are not working together. So that's kind of the, those are the, the long-term things that I think we need to focus on. But of course, we have our near-term priorities. And so I want to talk about three things we're thinking about as an industry as we approach um, what could be an uncertain winter. And, if, and you've all seen the case counts. We are really concerned in watching things like hospital capacity now because we are um, because um, as case counts go up, hospitalizations go up, and our capacity is getting tighter. So in April and May, hospital revenue dropped between 40 and 70 percent. It was really a perfect storm. Revenue bottomed out right at the time that we were investing in PPE and alternative care sites. And during those three months, hospitals lost $143 million a month in Oregon. The second quarter looked a little better thanks to federal CARES Act dollars. But if you look at a key metric, which is net patient revenue, it had it declined 30 percent for the um, through the first six months of 2020. In the spring, some of our rural hospitals were in dire financial straits. We were very concerned about the ability for them to keep their doors open. In fact, at one point, I think I said to my team that success in 2020 would mean we did not lose a rural hospital. Fortunately, the CARES Act funds um, began flowing right about that time, and um, those hospitals were out of immediate financial danger. Um, we appreciate the work of the legislature in appropriating some hospital relief funds that I think will help some of them to survive what could be a very difficult and uncertain winter. So while our volume has recovered somewhat, it's not back to pre-COVID levels. Um, recovery is typically for a hospital right now, anecdotally between 85 and 95%. So we're about 85 to 95% back from pre-COVID volumes. But you know, if you look at that in comparison to what an average hospital's margin is, it, it could be some difficult times ahead if volume does not recover. So the difference between 85% volume and 100% of pre-COVID volume could be the hospital's entire margin. It could be the hospital's margin plus some of their community benefit spending. So drops in volume of this size could be difficult to sustain over time. It's really too early to tell. We're just not far enough into this um, event to know if volume's gonna recover, but if it doesn't, hospitals will have to make some hard choices um, about capital projects, staffing, and services. So, you know, this is important to rural hospitals because those hospitals are not just the healthcare providers in their communities, they are the anchor tenants of the community. They are the largest employer. They are the healthcare provider. They do work in the community. And so we're really watching this dynamic closely, especially when it comes to our rural hospitals. So the second thing we're looking at, I won't elaborate on because Representative Salinas touched on it, and that's the state budget, including Medicaid enrollment and funding. Um, this session, we will be focused on the budget. We're going to continue to watch um, the growth of the Medicaid program given pandemic related job losses. The dust is still set settling on the state budget picture and it's still a little bit murky. Um, we, we did support and had strong support for measure 108, the tobacco tax measure. Um, we invested in that initiative pre pandemic to support the Oregon health plan and who knew how critical that investment would be at this point in time. But I want to note that uncertainty in the healthcare system is just going to be exacerbated. 
if we if we do, don't have a fully funded health plan and we think it's critical that the state prioritize health care for Oregonians during a pandemic. So the third thing we're watching is capacity and pandemic fatigue. In 2020, our hospitals have dealt with the pandemic. They dealt with catastrophic wildfires. And unfortunately, we have one hospital that's in, been impacted by foreign hackers. Through that, we've dealt with a regulatory landscape that's been changing very frequently. At one point in the last month, we were dealing with four different state rulemaking processes, a work group on proposed legislation, and that's just at the state level. In the spring, guidance was changing weekly at the federal level around PPE, and we worked really hard to keep our employees safe and to support them as they dealt with fear and dealt with change fatigue. So essentially, as we approach the winter months with hospitalizations on the rise and ICU capacity diminishing, we're concerned about what the future looks like over the next couple of months if we do not arrest the rate of growth of our COVID cases. Our workforce, quite frankly, is exhausted. What I hear most of most frequently from hospitals is they need, that they need time to absorb the changes in 2020. So from our standpoint, we believe that now is, is not the time um, from a policy standpoint to add um, a lot of, of, of new requirements or to, you know, to essentially pile on, but to support our hospitals and their workforce as they respond to COVID-19 and as they absorb all the changes that, that have been made in 2020. So we should focus our policy on supporting the healthcare system during COVID-19, and then look at those things that are gonna support those long-term imperatives, behavioral health, diversity and health equity. And so essentially um, we are hoping that in this legislative session, we can have some really clear priorities about the most important things to get done. Anything else should wait. So to wrap it up, I wanna to point to a few bright spots in the pandemic and then turn it over to Brian. So despite, you know, despite all of the challenges, as, as I agree with Representative Sling, it feels like a bunch of bad news, but I think it's really important to look at the bright spots of the pandemic, because if we can take an opportunity to learn from this experience, and if we don't learn from the experience, we have really missed um, a chance to change our future for the better. So the shift to telehealth happened dramatically, it happened quickly, and there is still significant promise um, for us to capture in telehealth. We had incredible statewide collaboration of healthcare systems, and healthcare providers. We learned a lot of disaster of, of lessons around disaster preparedness that will help us in the future as we will inevitably face another natural disaster at some point. So I think through COVID and, and wildfires, hospitals really continue to serve as anchors in their community, whether in the metro area, in Medford, or in Eastern Oregon. Um, this has been an, a year of unprecedented challenges for the hospital field, but I have never been more proud um, to work in this industry. So with, with that, and hopefully on a hopeful note, I will uh, cede the floor to Brian. Thanks, Becky. Uh, thanks, Chair Salinas. Uh, and thanks, Bob, for making me follow such brilliant comments and uh, tucking me right in before lunch. That's the poll position, the prize speaking position at every conference. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Beringer, and I'm the CEO of the Oregon Medical Association. Um, and there's a lot that's been said, but um, I will uh, uh, attempt to carve out a, a another little piece here. Um, before we get started, though, I, I want to uh, just let you know, I hope everybody's safe and healthy. Um, and I want to thank everybody for everything you're doing right now to get us through the pandemic. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, all of you that have been impacted by the wildfires. I know a number of you had to evacuate and we lost at least one rural health clinic to the fires. Um, as you know, we're here to, uh, we were asked to talk about uh, rural health policy and where we should go from here. Um, and in normal times, where we need to go is always a challenging uh, question with rural health. There's always workforce concerns, there's shortages of funding, um, but these aren't normal times. Um, uh, we are still very much in the middle of a public health crisis where all healthcare providers are on the front lines of providing care and the front lines of helping everyone understand what public health measures are necessary for us to get through this thing. Um, then we were hit by wildfires, and now we're looking at a flu season and a significant surge in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. Um, as you all know, being a healthcare provider has always been important, especially in the rural areas, but with everything that is now going on in the world, your work and your voice has never been more important. The challenges facing the state and our citizens and you as providers have never been greater. Uh, let's start with COVID-19. Um, way back in February, uh, nine months ago, and it just pains me every time I say that, um, we shifted our focus to help address uh, the issues of the pandemic. Um, at the OMA, we've been focused on identifying resources, identifying resources and pushing for policies that will help those on the front lines uh, battle COVID-19. 
Hopefully some of you, you are using our daily resources that we have been sending out to help guide your practices and your patients through the impacts of, of the pandemic. Here's what we've been working on. Making sure there's adequate PPE for front lines and for community clinics restarting non-urgent and emergent procedures. Uh, PPE was a big deal in the beginning. Um, it seemed to level off, but now we're starting to see uh, 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 shortages again of, of uh, um, uh, gowns, gloves, uh, um, small fit masks, uh, those types of things. And so with a surge coming and with flu season coming, we got to make sure that we have the PPE to keep everybody up and running. Um, we're pushing for increased testing capacity. Our testing capacity has been going up, which is great. Um, but the reliability and the turnaround time on the testing is something that we're still uh, focused on. Um, we're still, and this pains me to say, but we're still uh, sadly advocating for aggressive public health messaging to help the public understand how to control the spread. Um, we're also working for permanent telehealth payment parity and flexibility. This has been one of the bright spots of the pandemic, and we should not reverse the gains we made uh, through telehealth. Um, we've been working with the governor and OHA to develop and communicate COVID-19 guidance and best practices. And as you know, um, some of them are very much moving targets, uh, especially the school metrics right now. Um, we're also partnering with our hospital colleagues to push for liability protection for providers that have to deviate from the standard of care to follow executive orders or department guidance from OHA. And finally, and this has been mentioned a few times, but we're advocating for additional financial, financial assistance and reductions of administrative burdens for practices. We must protect the healthcare safety net from financial ruin in order to serve patients now and after the pandemic. The pandemic has also increased stress on providers and provider wellness is also a significant concern. We are painfully aware that all of you have been pushed to your breaking point. We are very concerned about COVID-19 related burnout from financial pressures, difficulty rebounding, or the consequences of exposing oneself or family to the virus. You guys need a break. And instead of getting one, we have surging COVID-19 cases. We are hopeful that we can get some of these issues resolved, um, especially in the upcoming legislative session. Uh, Chair Salinas and her colleagues are working very hard to figure out what that session is going to look like. Um, it may be delayed, but certainly not going to look like a normal uh, session. Uh, it's probably going to be a, a, a massive set of video conferences, just like the special sessions were. Um, and there, but there's a number of challenges that we, we can't push off and that we've got to address. Um, here's where we'll be focused in this session, and some of these have already been mentioned. Uh, we got to pass a budget in a recession, um, and that's always a very, very hard job. Um, but we have to pass a Medicaid budget that covers Oregonians and doesn't create new hurdles for providers. Um, we have to make sure rural uh, workforce incentives program funding continues, uh, as well as renewing the, the tax credit uh, for uh, rural health care providers. Um, and then as uh, Chair Salinas mentioned, we're going to have to find some additional uh, uh, revenue for, for health care. Um, whether it's beer and wine tax, uh, the employer uh, health care mandate that was discussed last session. Um, we've got a little bit of a gap, and I'm going to be a little bit more positive because we've been dealing with some huge gaps, uh, but uh, we, we've got to find that revenue. Um, we also got to solve the telehealth uh, problem moving forward. We have a, a telehealth uh, sort of reprieve to the end of uh, 2020, uh, but we're working with the governor's office and the legislature to extend that and then also to solve it in 2021 so that we can capture the positive pieces of the uh, telehealth uh, expansion and, um, and move those forward uh, and uh, continue to use uh, telehealth in our practices. Um, and flexibility, and I know this is important for you guys, flexibility and especially audio only services or phone services, especially for our older populations is, is huge in this. Um, we're also gonna be working uh, and watching what's going on with health disparities. A, a lot's been said on that. We absolutely agree. Uh, that we've had health disparities and, and the pandemic has shown the light on that. Um, and the work of the governor's racial uh, justice council will be important and, and, um, and we will have to see how that plugs into the, the healthcare side. Um, we'll also be working on a prior authorization improvement package. Uh, the folks on uh, the panel are probably tired of hearing this <laughs> from me because uh, we've had this bill at the finish line for the last uh, few sessions, uh, but we're hoping to get this done uh, this session so that it's one less thing for you to worry about in your practices um, and with your patients is trying to sort out uh, prior authorizations. Um, vaccines are gonna be huge. Uh, not only the distribution of whatever vaccine we get for COVID-19 and how we manage all of that, but um, vaccine hesitancy that's going on right now in the state of Oregon. So um, the chair and others in the legislature have been fantastic partners in, in working on that and we'll, we'll be working on that more this, this upcoming session. 
Um, the main takeaway, though, uh, with whatever happens is uh, you guys need a break. Um, we all need a break. Uh, we need, we can't have a, a session that gets down rabbit holes um, and diverts all the work that's going on to deal with the pandemic right now. So we want to make sure that that focus is on, on the, the key elements, the budget and, and getting things done so that we can um, continue to focus on patient care, which is going to be so vital um, as the surge pushes on. Um, to close, uh, and given that we're less than a week uh, from the elections, I thought I would uh, wrap up with some winners and losers uh, from election day. I know everybody likes to talk about that. Um, and the first one was mentioned, but I think it is important to, to highlight that uh, a big winner is the Oregon budget writers. Um, the fact that uh, the uh, tobacco and vape tax pass does uh, trim 300 million off of our gap for healthcare. That's not nothing. Um, that's important. Um, and uh, that's going to be huge moving forward. Um, the other big development is is with uh, what's going on in the White House. Um, I think there were uh, uh, you know definitely two different paths for federal stimulus. Um, we're not going to make it without more federal stimulus and probably a couple more rounds of federal stimulus. And in fact, the reason the economy right now is looks as 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 good as it does and not horrible is because of CARES Act funding. And so we're going to need um, uh, one, if not more, uh, several rounds of. Uh, CARES Act funding and especially for providers. Um, so that's that's a win. Um, another uh, big winner is uh, providers in the legislature. Yay. Uh, uh, we've got uh, two new physicians uh, in the House, um, Representative Maxine Dexter in House District 33, which is in Portland, and, and Representative uh, Lisa Reynolds in House District 36. Um, we add those to a fantastic stable of providers. Uh, we, we keep uh, uh, Senator Steiner Hayward, uh, Representative Rachel Pruzak. Um, Representative Cedric Hayden, uh, Representative Sherry uh, Scouten, um, uh, Senator Fred Gerard, um, and then we also count uh, Representative M uh, Marty Wildey because of his professional experience and his spouse um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a provider there. Um, but we do have a big loss that I want to acknowledge, and that's uh, uh, the, the fantastic uh, Lori Monis Anderson, who leads us, uh, who has uh, chaired and led the Senate uh, Health Care Committee. Um, uh, for uh, for years, um, but that's where I like to point to uh, uh, a lot of other healthcare experts, like our own uh, Chair Salinas, uh, who uh, uh, has got her hand on the the rudder over on the House side, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, another big winner uh, in Oregon was democracy, um, massive uh, voter turnout, um, and Oregon's you know you, you can't turn on the TV without seeing what's going on with. With uh, mail-in balloting, uh, uh, mail-in balloting across the country, and uh, Oregon's mail-in ballot, ballot system continues to be the gold standard. And in fact, uh, um, I think uh, amongst uh, there's bipartisan uh, discussions as to the things that work really well in Oregon, and uh, that probably should be moved to some of these other states that are, are still trying to count their ballots. So, um, but we had a record-shattering 81% of registered voters uh, vote. Um, that's two, almost two and a half million Oregonians voted, and that's fantastic news. Um, on the other side, um, and it's been mentioned, uh, but I, I feel like it just needs to be drawn out. Um, no matter how you feel about the policy and the substance of measure 109, um, and measure 110, the psilocybin mushroom services program, um, and the decriminalization of, uh, personal possession, um, no matter the policy on that, um, that's a lose for Oregon because there was a lot of outside funding and uh, there's a lot of folks outside of Oregon. That view Oregon as their um, experimental place for ballot measures, and with those two wins, uh, that only furthers that perception. And I, I expect we'll see more of that and not less of that. So, um, uh, again, not commenting on the uh, the substance of the ballot measures, but the fact that um, others uh, from around the country uh, use Oregon's uh, initiative petition to to test things. Um, I don't think that's good for us overall. And then finally, and this, uh, this really pains me to say, uh, I, I do think uh, public health is a big loser in this election. Um, I'm not sure how it became so easy to politicize public health, um, but I think it's on all of us to figure out what we need to do to repair that. Um, when this is all over, we are going to have to, to um, take time to inventory the lessons learned. Um, Becky mentioned a number of them, um, but one of the biggest ones may be how we uh, rebuild and learn and teach folks how to trust public health again. So. Um, I don't want to end on that negative note. Um, again, I want to thank all of you. Uh, there are some positives here. Um, things, I think, in uh, uh, Mayish looked a lot worse with the budget and with things than they look now. Um, and I think we have some encouraging things out there, um, but it's going to be a battle. We're going to have a tough winter um, with our numbers, um, with our hospitalizations, um, and with flu season uh, thrown on top. So um, we've got a lot of work uh, ahead of us. 
Um, a lot of work to get through that session, um, but uh, we're we're ready to partner with our folks uh, um, at the legislature and at the hospitals to, to to get it done. Thanks, Bob. Excellent. Thanks to all of you for your um, for your perceptions of what's going on and in what direction we need to go in. I'd like to wrap around back to uh, what's right in front of us, which is an upcoming legislative session, and. Ask uh, starting with Representative Salinas, but then having you all comment here a little bit. But um, how do we move forward when we start our session next year in a way that allows us to focus on clear priorities, considering what happened last legislative session, where very little was done, there were walkouts. Um, and an, it really an inability to do anything, knowing that we have a long session, that we must focus on our budget, that we have so many health care priorities in front of us. How do we go into the session in such a way that we're able to move forward successfully? And Representative Salinas, do you want to start with that one? I would love to. I was actually hoping you'd ask Brian or Becky so that you could give me a clue as to what I'm supposed to do. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I think, you know, it is going to be challenging, but as um, Brian alluded to, we do have some things um, that could have gotten across the finish line. I think, you know, we came right up to the finish line and then, you know, we had um, just early adjournments um, due to, you know, Republican walkouts where we just didn't finish our work. So there are a number of things, items on the table um, and, uh, you know, step therapy and prior authorization is a bill that, like Brian said, has been worked on for a while. And I think our providers would love to see that wrapped up. Um, there are also some things around um, insulin and PrEP and PEP, um, you know, um, which are HIV treatments and, you know, insulin for folks with diabetes. There are things, you know, that I think can improve access and lower costs um, on those prescription drugs. So, so things like that, that I think we're ready to go, we just didn't get them across the finish line for other reasons um, are some things that we'll start off with. And for the most part, most of those things should not cost the legislature or the state um, any money. So I think we'll wanna you know, start with those types of things and then start looking at some of these bigger picture problems that we've all presented um, without, I think, like, you know, to Becky's point also, without adding a lot of new complications when we're still trying to deal with the pandemic. But what is it that we can do to remove barriers? So, you know, what can we do around telehealth? Like both of them had mentioned, this has been kind of a big, bright, shining thing um, for rural areas and the legis, you know, and going back Another step, you know, as Brian mentioned, you know, telephone, I think is really important for, you know, some of our seniors, but, you know, we have a lot of language barriers that we've identified over the last several months where we're not able to get care and direct services to folks or even information out. I think it was Becky or Brian who mentioned, you know, um, that the state has kind of fallen short on trying to get the word out about COVID and how, you know, the, you know, just the responsible way to respond. We're falling short on a lot of these items that we still need to talk about. But the one thing that I think the legislature put in place that I think would be helpful is the new um, broadband funding stream, because our rural areas are not going to be able to access some of this care via telehealth if we don't have the infrastructure for broadband. So um, that was something that we were able to accomplish over um, one of the special sessions. And I was really you know, pleased with my, my colleague, Pam Marsh, for continuing to push on this. But I think there's just still more to be done for that kind of infrastructure access. So things like that, of that nature, that we're still going to continue to need to figure out, like you know, where do we prioritize this and how much additional funding do we give to it? The things that Brian's been talking about on kind of public health, what does our public health infrastructure look like? We, you know, some of our local public health Authorities, I think, have been doing um, a pretty decent job, but I think there are others that, you know, really need some guidance and help. And, you know, and we do, um, kind of going back to public health modernization and trying to fund that a few years ago. We only got halfway there. We only got to 20 million. So we're still about 30 million dollars short on what that complete picture looks like. And, you know, that's not a small chunk of change going into a, you know, decreasing revenue cycle. So, again, I think th thinking about some of these bigger picture things, how we start to fill in holes, knowing that our, our mental and behavioral health systems really have been inadequate. How, you know, how do we figure out workforce? That was something that, you know, also, um, I had a bill on this, the late representative Greenlick also had kind of like a blueprint for mental and behavioral health. Um, those both didn't make it over the finish line either um, last session, but I think we'll be giving another examination. I know this is a, a priority for the speaker as well. Um, 
so yeah, so trying to figure out how we integrate that behavioral health care access into kind of what we're trying to do around primary care. So that's kind of, I think, I mean, I think that's, and then going back to kind of what Becky was also saying is some of these bigger picture things that we've been working on, the SB 889 um, work group to try to bring down the cost of healthcare across all payers and all providers, I think will be a really significant um, piece of work when they finally come out with their finished product. But I think we will see value-based payment model as kind of the, the key feature of whatever recommendations this task force um, puts forward. Um, Cause like Becky said, fee for service really has failed us. So um, looking at things like that real, um, you know, some infrastructure things of our healthcare system, payment reform, how we do things differently on telehealth and access. I think are still going to be really big priorities. Thank you, Brian. Do you uh, have some things you want to add to that? So I'll just add um, very briefly. I'm the newcomer of the bunch, so I hesitate to comment too much. Uh, I'll let it, uh, the chair's uh, words speak for themselves, but. I just wanted to add that I think there's really an important role for stakeholders in being clear about our priorities. In communicating to legislators, this is not the year to have an unlimited list of asks. It is a year to folk for us to focus on the critical few things that we think need to be done and then to be um, intentional in our communication to to let us to, to the legislature about that. So I think when we talk about uh, or when I when I mentioned, you know, this is not a year to pile on. We have an obligation ourselves as stakeholder groups to be. Um, to be careful about the, our number of priorities, to be clear about which ones are the most important. Um, and then, um, obviously, I think, uh, and I want to emphasize, I think, you know, it's a challenge as you look at the short term needs. I think our short term needs should be primarily uh, addre addressing the COVID 19 response and those things that we know we have to do this session. The budget is obviously job number one, and I think all of our organizations will be focused on the budget. And then, um, um, to, to the point Representative Selena has made, and I'd emphasized earlier that, you know, we do have a couple of really big picture issues that we can't afford to lose sight of because they are key to the future and making sure that in the press of the urgent, we don't lose sight of those really important things. Yeah, and it, it's, it's been said, but I'll, what I'll just add is that uh, governing is hard. <laughs> and um, the uh, the Democrats right now and the in Oregon are poised to uh, I think maintain their there's a few outstanding counts going on but maintain their super majorities but they don't have a walkout proof uh, I don't even know what that would be called the 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 super 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 majority of of, of pre preventing walkouts but what I what I will say is you know we just had a very divisive election and and you can see it across the country you can see it uh, in the state you can see it in uh, um, the different uh, metropolitan areas and rural areas of Oregon um, that people are still uh, uh, divided. And I, I think this is a, a silver lining here is that the legislature has a fantastic opportunity to really focus on what's right in front of us and that's helping people. That's helping everybody that's been harmed by uh, um, the pandemic, harmed by the wildfires, um, and whether it's working on the healthcare side to make sure people are being treated or whether it's working on the financial assistance side to make sure people are, are being helped through this terrible uh, time that we're in right now. Um, that is an opportunity for people to come together. And, and again, that's that's why uh, Chair Salinas is, sits in her seat and I sit in mine is, is because um, she and her colleagues have to have to sort through this. And I mean colleagues from, you know, one to, to 90. Um, you know, this isn't just uh, on one party. This is on everybody coming together and sorting this out. Um, and getting us in and out quickly um, so that we can just uh, get back to, to um, uh, the way things, try to get back to what the way things used to be. So thank you all. Let, uh, let me uh, kind of wrap around to something that Becky had said, which is we don't want to lose sight as we, as we look at and work on the short term things, we don't lose sight of the big picture items. And one of those both short and big picture items is public health. Uh, you all have made some comments about whether public health has done a good job or a bad job getting messaging out. Uh, there are some communities that have their own uh, public health departments and others that allow the state to do it. Uh, Representative, you mentioned the, the, the Public Health Modernization Act. Uh, it's a, how do we, at a time where we're in the middle of a pandemic that's not ending in anytime soon, a flu season, 
we all know that something else is coming. There just has to be, right? Uh, so we know there will be other pandemics and other things down the road. Uh, and then in, in slight and more day-to-day -day public health issues that we're letting drop at the moment because of the pandemic. How do we address public health in the state of Oregon to strengthen it and integrate it better into our healthcare system? And I'll let you all I don't, mind, I don't mind starting off. I mean, I think, as I alluded to in my statement, I think part of it is prioritizing the investment there, right? Um, you know, I don't think we necessarily have been seeing uh, the type of investment in public health um, that is actually needed to, to do the kind of job that I think we all would prefer to be seeing right now and to be witnessing on the ground. And so I think that is a big part of it. You know, I think, you know, going back to not even having data, which seems so basic. Um, to the fundamentals and foundation of being able to respond in a public health crisis. Um, you know, we, some of our systems just aren't up to date, but yeah, I just really think we do have to prioritize what that investment looks like. And then going back to, you know, I think Brian mentioned it, you know, do we have to look at revenue because we have to respond to a public health crisis in a serious way? So, you know, do we look at a fear and tax or an you know, employer um, sponsored fee for healthcare. I'm not sure, and I don't know where the appetite is. Um, but, you know, the one thing that um, we haven't mentioned and has been in just about every report I see and every recommendation I've been hearing is the need for that secret housing too, which I think just goes hand in hand. And now that we have had these, you know, catastrophic wildfires in our rural areas, you can't really have um, a clear public health response um, without stable housing, right? And you can't really be able to, you know, that that investment that you make in people and, and getting them care, I think is probably lost unless they have stable housing. So that's, I think, an area also where we'll be looking for some, some funding sources. Brian or Becky? Yeah, I would just add, I think, um, you know, it's been interesting as we look at this country's response overall, and, and then as we look at Oregon's response, which has been, you know, better than, than, than most of the country, but we have not made public health the kind of priority that we needed to make it over the last several, probably several decades. And so we're kind of experiencing the fallout from that now in, um, the, resor in the lack of resources in the system when we, when we needed it. So I think, first of all, we've got to go back and look at that balance and make sure we're appropriately resourcing public health. Um, I was in a, in a board meeting for an or, a national organization I sit on in January. And as we were looking at the priorities for the year, we, uh, the small work group I, that I was on recommended that we not focus on disaster response. How stupid do I feel that I even made that recommendation in January? It was. So, but I think when we're not in a disaster, when we're not in a situation where we're facing the kind of public health emergency that we are now, it's easy to make those things less of a priority. So we need to do a reset. I think the second thing we need to do is that the experience of public health in, was very different in depending on what county you were in. Some counties did an, you know, did an outstanding job and the partnership with the hospital system was seamless. Things worked really well. In some, it was not so good. So I think we need to do a debrief at some point and identify why the response worked so well in some areas and worked and, and didn't work as well in others. Because you shouldn't, the public health response really should not be dependent on on what county you live in, but to a certain extent during the pandemic, um, it was. Yeah, and I agree with what's been said. And I, I guess what I will just add on at the end is that uh, I'm guilty. I'm guilty as, as as all of you for taking public health for granted. And that's what happens with public health. When public health works, we don't see it. You know, uh, when you go into the restaurant and you know you eat a food, you, you eat your meal, and and people have washed their hands, and and uh, there's requirements for ha where the temperature for storing uh, uh, food. When you draw water from your your public uh, water system, I mean, all these things are public health and and time tested public health uh, things that we've been doing uh, and lessons we've learned for for decades, if not centuries. Um, and uh, because it operates in the background, we all take it for granted. And uh, that this bit us uh, badly because we did because we then got into a situation where uh, people started to question, uh, you know, what what's coming out of public health. So. We, I, I don't, we have to rebuild that. We all have to commit to doing that. We all have to commit to doing it in a way that uh, sort of, uh, you know, goes, uh, you know, 
starts at the beginning, I think, because again, um, the last thing I think people that aren't on board need to hear is to be lectured by scientists. Um, I mean, they, they, we need to find that common ground and we need to find that starting point of, of what public health does and, and why we should follow public health guidance. So um, we all get in the car right now and we put on a seatbelt and you know what? I don't, we don't get into accidents every day, but that seatbelt helps us for that when we do. Um, and uh, the, the things that are going on right now with mask guidance and, and uh, social distancing and things like that are, are just amazing to me that we can't get our, our collective uh, hands around it. So, um, so yeah, there's work there to be done. Um, I don't know the answer, but I, I think we've got to go back. Um, and uh, and if Chair Greenlick was here right now, he'd be the first one I'd be apologizing to because he was the one that was always saying, you know, hey, public health, public health, public health. So, um, we got to get back to that. So, with all the topics that are that we've discussed, and we haven't even got we haven't even gotten below. The, the, the slightest part of the service on any of them. We haven't touched on the, the fee for service to value based yet, and we haven't gotten nearly into the, the level of workforce, behavioral health, and, and, and uh, um, primary care, et cetera, that I would love to be able to do today. Um, but we are going into a session that is really unusual. Uh, we are not going to be in the building together. We're not sure how these things are going to work. How do the people that are listening here, we've had 135 people on this call this morning so far for this session. Uh, we have all of the folks that will hear, see this later that are interested in getting involved. How do people get involved in such a bizarre legislative session that we're not even, you know, we're not sure how hearings will be done, how people will testify. What are, what are your, um, your ideas of how people can be heard? So I'll start with this one, Bob, thanks. Um, so this morning, I think I just got a notice from the speaker's office that we are now um, equipped electronically, virtually to accept public testimony. And so the, the direction from the speaker was, if you have public testimony that you'll be accepting, you know, we'll need to start figuring out how this will work and what this means for your time. So we will be able to set up, um, a way for the public to testify and as always we'll still be able to you know um, accept testimony and that sort of thing and i know um personally and i'm sure lots of my colleagues because i know i'm on these emails with 60 my or 59 of my at least house colleagues um people are continuing to reach out i think more than ever because there is so much need out there right and so they are expressing their views and they are expressing their views um, around politics and our elections and that sort of thing, but certainly on healthcare. I know that, you know, my, my staff has done such an amazing, incredible job with responding to um, unemployment need that you know, I've been getting requests from all over the state, word gets out and, you know, and we respond when we can um, and help out if, you know, um, there's a legislator who, who needs additional help. But I think that um, we will make sure that the public can continue and, um, you know, and any of your advocates, um, can continue to reach out to to I'm someone can't get a hold of me. I'm like, what? Every lobbyist in Salem has my phone number. You should be able to get it too. Um, but certainly, yeah, email and like I said, virtually we will be set up um, if not by December, certainly by January. So I'll add, um, I hail originally from Alaska where the capital is not connected to the road system. So legislative sessions in Alaska, um, you know, people couldn't drive to the Capitol to testify. They either had to get on a plane or do it virtually. And so it is certainly possible to have a legislative session that incorporates good public, good and meaningful public feedback without people physically being in the building. I think as I think about the session, I'm more thinking about how legislators interact with each other and with their staff and how that's going to work in a socially distanced environment um, because, as we all know, it's, you know, the interaction between uh, lawmakers and with their own, their teams are really critical. So I worry less about how the public can engage because there are ways, I think, for the public to engage not only in formal testimony, which it's really good to hear is happening, but um, for those informal communications to happen, whether they're phone calls, whether they're emails or, or some other way. So I feel like over the last, um, over the last six months, legislators have been very accessible. Um, I've had lots of Zoom calls. It's different. I mean, I wish I could sit down and have coffee with people. I can't wait until I can. But 
for now, this is working. And so I really appreciate how legislators have made themselves accessible and available. And I have every confidence that they'll do that during session. Yeah, I, I, I echo what's been said. I, I actually think this is one of the brightest spots of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, Oregon legislators have always had a bit of a hallmark of being accessible to everybody. And, and that's been one of the things that I think is, is great about the Oregon legislature. Um, but what I will say is, uh, because in years past, you know, we have wanted to bring uh, the rural perspective, a rural provider perspective in, and and it, you're practicing. And so, you know, uh, sometimes it's uh, through the the phone at the committee, and we all know how some of those phone calls are not great, and and the, the connections are bad, and you can't see the audience and so forth. Um, and uh, we would oftentimes uh, tape uh, our members uh, and take them into a legislator's office and play the message that way. You know, so they could see him, but, but with the pandemic, you know, you can't walk into a legislator's office now and say zoom and they, or, or, or teams and they don't know what you're talking about because, uh, you know, they have been in this same video conference, uh, hell that we've all been in, uh, now for 7 months. So everybody is really, uh, I think, um, used to the, the video conference calls. And I think that's fantastic for rural Oregon, because, um, I, I think gone are the days of where we have to figure out how to pull you out. Of your hospital or your practice to, to bring you over to Salem to sit you in a committee when we can bring you in by video uh, conference and everybody knows how to use it and and we'll be able to to plug in and nobody's going to be concerned about you know somebody on video conference so I think that's a bright spot. Excellent. Well, thank you all for that. Um, and I do want to uh, uh, invite you all back sometime after the legislative session starts. Uh, and we'll, we'll pull together some other sessions over the course of this next um, uh, full length of the legislative session to hear back from people about how it's going and, and where else we can, uh, we can all help to uh, get to some of these goals that we've talked about today. Uh, Representative Salinas, uh, Becky and Brian, thank you very, very much for your time today and your um, your thoughts and wisdom. We've gotten a lot of comments in the, in the question and answer side as, as well as some of those questions, and we'll share those with you as well uh, after our, our conference is over. So again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, for the attendees that are here, um, thank you for being here. We will be back up and started again tomorrow morning uh, with a session that talks about OHA and the state's um, testing policy and how that's going to be going forward in our rural communities. So look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.